Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, a kind of a midweek fun get-together with Gavin. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 10th of October 2018. Okay, Gavin, we're kind of moving into the throes of fall, but uh, we do want people to keep George in your prayers today because, uh, mm. once again, Florida's going through a Category 4 hurricane. It's going to be just north of him, but they expect a lot of flooding in his area. And uh, uh, do keep uh, the residents of Florida and anybody in the path of the hurricane in your prayers. We're Christians. That's what we do. Don't complain that we talk about our health and the weather. That's who we are. Gavin, how you been doing? Well, Kevin, I'm 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 quite well, thank you. Although, um, for somebody who's not paid to do anything by anybody or accountable to anybody apart from the good Lord, it is remarkably busy and and uh, quite demanding. So last week I found myself speaking in London uh, at the George Bell Conference, which was very exciting because um, it was held in Church House. Oh and, wow! Uh, I, I uh, how did you get permission to do that? Well, because the answer is they'll take anyone's money. That's why. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, then the splendid man, Richard Simmons, who organizes and who has doggedly kept George Bell in front of the public, um, hired one of the conference rooms. So I have I was in and out of Church House in London for 20 years, especially for General Synod. And since I left, it's been a place I haven't gone back to i haven't been invited to indeed so it was really quite something to walk through the arch of westminster abbey and uh head off as a speaker into a room and to look at the people on the doors not that they're the same they they uh they belong to an agency the church uses to run the place but so for me it was very em emotional um in a good way i could never ever have foreseen these circumstances 20 years ago and um it's hard work because to try and gain a sense of uh, why George Bell is important for this moment in the church. Took a good deal of thinking and reading and praying. Uh, and um, I, I got there, but it's tiring. People may not know this, but I uh, just this week took all the servers down that were up here in my office. And so it's really quiet up here. And I call that silence. It's really new, but it's really, you can really sense it's palatable, the silence. And I was watching, you know, some of the, the Twitter feed coming out of your conference, and I was waiting for the Church of England to respond. And it was that same palatable silence, nothing. No, no, no uh, Justin Welby, no Church of England, no bishops at all have responded at all to this conference, even though George Carey called them out on us. It was very good having George Carey there. And I have to say, he's looking well, and he's in good shape. And he gave a uh, an, an, an archbishop like paper hmm. essentially what george did was to come and say to the church of england bishops why are you silent why have none of you seen it as your responsibility to raise questions about about the innocence well we're, we're partly back into the kavanagh and blazy forward issue uh the, the the question of the presumption of innocence is so important both to our society, but above all to Christians. One of the things I tried to do in, in, in my talk was to talk about um, how reputation and how innocence are spiritual uh, elements in our you know, Christianity, as well as political and, and existential ones. And so Archbishop George laid a challenge down to the Church of England bishops. Where are you? Why are you silent? This is a matter of national and, uh, and ecclesial importance. And there was absolute silence. Now, the fact that the silence suggests two things. One, a level of very serious control from the Archbishop will be down. Uh, and the other, well, one has to say cowardice, moral cowardice. Um, I think if you sat uh, many of the bishops in the Church of England uh, who are good people um, with keen consciences, and you said to them privately, can you not see the importance of this? They would they would most likely say, this really is important. But the church is suffering from institutionali institutionalitis. Uh, and this, this is one of the most dangerous conditions for any organization. When you put the, the, the reputation of an organization before moral and ethical precepts. Now, it's always a temptation for anyone running an organization, as the archbishops of York and Canterbury are at the moment, to do that. But it, it, it's a very serious moral flaw, and that's what the Church of England is suffering from over this at the moment. 
No, oh, indeed. It's uh, amazing to watch uh, all the things that happen outside of the Church of England to raise up Christ uh, that just go silent. You had the visitation of uh, Franklin Graham, nothing. You know, oh, he's here? Oh, okay. You know, it's just, it, it's amazing how quiet the, the people who wear purple in, in your country can really be. Um, well, and also we, we, we had we had Welby uh, taking, you know, being very vocal and very active over left-wing politics. Oh, sure. Uh, and sending the signal out that actually Christianity and left-wing politics are very closely aligned, which they're not. Um, but but the implication that anyone who doesn't share their politics, you know, is either sub-Christian or or, or or less than Christian. But the, the the problem here is that one of the things that's happening in our society will come onto this, I think, later on in our conversation, as we look at the cultural and political pressures placed on Christians. Um, I, I'll go on saying this because I think it's very important. But there's a great sense in Europe in particular that many of the factors that were around in the 1930s in Germany are beginning to reappear in our society too. Uh, and and that, that involves a division of the church between those who capitulate and for the sake of an easy ride go along with secular values as they are at the time. And those who say the gospel requires us to speak out and not collaborate at this particular point. So it isn't just that the Church of England bishops are being silent. They're being silent in a context. And the context is one where the screw is being turned on Christianity and on the faith. And it's exactly at this moment that Christians ought to speak out. And thank goodness that some of them, even if they're bakers, baptized bakers, <laughs> are willing to speak out and hold the line when bishops, archbishops and clergy aren't. Well, it's amazing because uh, you certainly had your case in Ireland or, or the UK there. Um, we had the case here in Colorado about the baker who said, you can't force me as a business person to do things that are against my conscience. Uh, now, I know in America we take our freedom of speech and uh, our liberties pretty you know, importantly. I've not seen that desire for liberty so much in England, is that something that's that's there? It's just an undercurrent. It's very hard to know, Kevin. The the, the the there is a dreadful sense that the people of England have become infantilized. Mm -hmm. uh, the growth of the state over the last fifty years since the Second World War, uh, a state that prescribes enormous prescribes enormous qualities of of of, of drugs to. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. Statistic came out yesterday that 10% of the population are being given antidepressant drugs by the doctors. Well, I'm and, sure and it's higher than that. I think that's just the reported. Well, uh, yeah. And, and the, there is such a high level of antidepressant drugs in the urine that, that gets uh, peed out into the rivers and waters that marine life is being, uh, is being severely affected by it. Um, so there's the infantilization of the state. Um, but there's also, uh, it's quite closely connected with the, the, the Brett Kavanagh and Blasey Ford incident. Mm -hmm. it, I've just written an article that will come out tomorrow where one of the things I've tried to show is that the um, uh, we're, we're heading for a new civil war. It's a civil war in the West. You had your first American civil war, which is pretty dreadful. But we're on the, we're on the, the cusp of a second civil war, and it's between uh, collectivists and the rights of the individual. So the, 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 if we, we just touch on the Blasey Ford Kavanaugh thing for a moment, one of the issues was that the Blasey Ford side said uh, Kavanaugh is guilty, even if he didn't do these things or did some of them, partly because he belongs to a group of people that we want to hold guilty for a whole series of crimes. Guilty by association. He's white, by he's conservative, he doesn't uh, he's not lived up to the presumption of innocence. Uh, well, the the presumption is that it was suspended. It didn't mm -hmm. count. Yep. Uh, and so it, he, he was white, he was rich, he was a judge. Uh, most importantly, he may be about to vote on abortion laws, which I think is what drove much of the hysteria. But what it be, although he wasn't guilty in... in uh, by any evidence he was he was found guilty by about half the country by association now this really matters because this isn't just an american thing this is something we're doing here too uh, and the the great civil war that's taking place in our society is between collectivist identity politics and the sanctity of the individual so when it comes down to this this cake it it touches this as well um we'll discover that i'm sure we'll hear that the gay activists who wanted to force the bakers to 
bake their collectivist slogans can't bear the idea that the individual bakers have individual consciences and can separate what they believe from what they do and that they're entitled to. So they, well, they in fact, they're, out, talking they're outraged. Before about second class Christians, here we have second class citizens. Because uh, yeah. once the side who lost, thank God, this time, they're going to try and try again because they don't feel like they're equal Christians unless the whole or equal citizens unless equal the whole citizens, world yes. agrees with them and affirms them. Well, because it's not equality what they're talking about. What they're really talking about is 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 an existential angst. I think born of the very fact that they live with the fault lines of what it is to have a homosexual identity, which involves a certain amount of narcissism and, 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 and the incapacity to live biologically uh, in, in a way that's in sync uh, between mind and body. But be that as it may, Mr. Lee, who brought this case against the Bakers, is furious and angry and has said that he now feels like he's a second-class citizen. Well, the, the corollary of that is he won't feel like he's a first-class citizen until he's crushed the Christian bakers. Uh, so his equality is not equality at all. It's a power, it's a power play. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come to the kind of some people, you know, George Orwell, um, some people being more equal than others. Uh, we are facing in the West a very serious cultural, ethical, and spiritual crisis to do with the sanctity of the individual on the one hand and the immersion of the individual into collectivism on the other. Now, one uh, feeds Christianity. Uh, one is, if you like, uh, an integral part of the Judeo-Christian revelation. God made each one of us unique. Jesus died for each one of us as if we had been the only person there. Uh, uh, we are introduced by Jesus into an intimate personal relationship with the father collectivism which is essentially marxism or or socialism uh, looks at people and says well you value or you have significance because you belong to this group and anything that you display as a, as an individual comes second to that in other words you can say that collectivism is an assault on the revelation that, that we find in the Gospels and in the Incarnation. So this isn't just a matter of freedom of conscience for Christian bakers in Ireland, though it is that and it's usually important. It isn't just a matter that um, Brett Kavanagh gets to be a judge on the Supreme Court because nobody could prove that he did anything that would uh, disable his, his membership. It's a matter for the integrity of the whole church worldwide to say individuals matter because God made us this way. It's about the integrity of revelation and incarnation. Oh, Gavin, now we have to go back to the silent Church of England. Yeah. I would have expected when this decision came out from the uh, UK Supreme Court today, uh, saying the Ashers can bake any cake they want and can't be forced to uh, put somebody's ideology on their cake, that the Church of England would have said, you know, we've been following this case. We're so great that, you know, uh, the UK in a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, not a 5-4 split, not, you know, uh, I don't, how many of you guys got there? Uh, five people on your court? Uh, I think uh, so. You know, there was no split. It was unanimous. Uh, when the, the court said, he heck no, you can't do that. Um, I would expect the Church of England or somebody in purple to say, wow, what, this is a win for the church as well because uh, the thoughts of Christ uh, may not be non-offensive to the society as a whole. So, Kevin, you're I, an Anglican who's left tech to, to join the ACNA as a matter of conscience and conviction, mm -hmm. and I'm an Anglican who's left the Church of England to join the Christical Episcopal Church for exactly the same reason. So it's easy for us to um, be critical of the people we've left. That's why we left them, but they shouldn't make it this easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the, the blogger, Adrian Hilton, uh, otherwise known as Archbishop Cranmer, one of the first things he did this morning was to say, so, bishops of the Church of England, where were you? Why has why have not many of you? Oh no, not one of you supported the ashes in public. Actually, he just said bishops, Anglican bishops, and I I direct message him and said, "Hey, come on, Adrian. There have been bishops here who've been speaking about it in the public space quite enthusiastically." And he wrote me a very sweet note saying, "You know, I'm in the Church of England, obviously," <laughs> and, <laughs> and he did obviously, but mm -hmm. but nonetheless, it it is. 
It, it is mind-boggling and it is extraordinary that they should fall so far below their Christian public duty. I mean, if you if you were one of these these people, the, the, the legal costs were, I think, over three hundred thousand uh, pounds. They they had the whole force of the establishment against them. The Equalities Commission of Northern Ireland. They had to seek refuge in a different country in a different court. I mean, and they were just being Christians who loved Jesus and were following the Bible. Was it truly beyond? the bishops of the Church of England to express any level of sympathy and support of them both privately and publicly. It's well, it's frankly outrageous and it's shameful. Oh, it, it is. It's like uh, oh, there's just so many analogies uh, th that can go this way because you never see these activists go into a Muslim bakery uh, and, and expect the same. You know, of course. They're just trying to take off the Christians, pick them off one by one, and they're allowed to do it because the Church of England has no response. Well, we'll just watch and see what happens. No big deal. Um, and they're getting away yeah, but I with just, it. I just, I, yeah. I just want to big up Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Center mm, and sure. the work done by Andrea Minchiello Williams because um, these are the people who are there for Christians every time some element of persecution or, or discrimination takes place. These are the people who stood beside them and, and, and gave them the help that they needed. And again, if you were to ask the Christian Legal Center or Christian Concern uh, what level of help they get from uh, Anglican bishops, uh, the only person I know that's that's in there is Michael Nazi Ali. Uh, me too, but but I'm, this is not to say anything about me. Michael Nazi Ali, I think, is the only one and he's retired. Where again are the other Church of England bishops offering support to the one agency that provides help to Christians who are discriminated against for their witness at work. It, it's, you know, the, the, I feel the Church of England under very serious judgment. The lights have gone out. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> in moving my, all my servers and unplugging everything, I forgot to charge the batteries to my uh, um, my lights. We put, eh, no big deal at all. But <laughs> I, I, I like to make the analogy that the Church of England has moved to the basement like my servers. You know, it's quiet. You don't hear from them anymore. They're irrelevant to the situation. Well, my servers aren't. My servers are more relevant than the uh, uh, clergy within the Church of England. Let's move on to a story about getting away with it. We talked about, uh, obviously, activists trying to get away with it, the Church of England allowing it. Um, the Church of, of England also allows people within the church, uh, the clergy, to get away with stuff. And uh, you uh, are following a story uh, about a marriage uh, that happened within the Church of Wales. I thought you could, well, not Church of Wales, where, where did that happen? Church of England. Church of England. And I wonder if you could bring us up today. I'll post the pictures while you're talking. Uh, yes, of course. Well, the question is, Kevin, when is a marriage not a marriage? Uh, and the, the rules in the Church of England uh, occupy this very strange middle ground where uh, clergy are entitled to exercise their civil rights to have a civil partnership so long as they promise the bishop that they're celibate and they're not expressing themselves sexually. This is a very difficult place for everyone to be in. Nobody wants to ask such questions. Um, but actually, it's, it's, it's a complete nonsense because, because if you're not if you're not sexually attracted or sexually active, then that hardly makes you a homosexual. <laughs> because because to be homosexual... The is irony defining. there is just mind-boggling. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, so, so, so you know, Newman, uh, John Henry Newman lived with male priest friends. They lived in community. They lived together. They loved each other very deeply, so deeply that people want to accuse them of being gay. Mm -hmm. um, but they had no sexual life and they had no erotic dimension to it. If there's no erotic dimension, you're not gay. If you're not gay, you shouldn't be in a civil partnership with a gay person. Mm. This is a terrible... So th there is an obvious sense that this is contradictory. The Church of England is in order to try and avoid the, the traditionalists leaving in droves, has said, well, our compromise is clergy can't get, get formally married uh, and we're not going to change the rules. Everyone knows there is this incremental pressure to move towards gay marriage. So every so often, someone tests the waters and see what happens. And this last weekend, two rather sweet and charming men who, who are who are homosexual ordinands at uh, one of our premier theological colleges in Cambridge, who were in love with each other, decided they would get married. Well, they said it was marriage. They put it on Facebook. They dressed up like it was marriage. They called it marriage. And uh, then when suddenly they discovered that um, the publicity they'd sought 
began to hold them accountable, they backtracked and said, oh, no, it, it, it really wasn't marriage. Oh, so okay. I mean, I so <laughs> hold on. Well, hold, no, I'm feeling a little better here. So you're saying the Church of England finally responded to something uh, that they're embarrassed about. Um, so what did no, the no, Church no, of no, England Church, say? What? It didn't say anything, Kevin. <laughs> oh, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that isn't that sad, Kevin? Um, the, the the pictures were taken down off Facebook, and everyone just went completely quiet. Uh, and, uh, and 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 actually, I was I was I mean, it's so difficult because one doesn't want to 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 punish or or make the personal lives of these two young men any more difficult. But the fact is, they were playing. They're playing with church. They're playing with marriage. They're playing with politics. And they're indulging themselves uh, without any regard to the damage that they do either to the faith or to the church or to this moment of equilibrium. Um, and again, it, you know, silence. Um, oh, yeah, but silence. I mean, it, it, if, if there's not one single feature that's slowly wiping out the Roman Catholic Church, it, it's nice that we're finally embracing it in the Church of England. You know, uh, what took us so long? Oh, Gavin. Yeah, it's disappointing. However, I have a solution. We, I'm gonna add, right. You know, I'm an IT person. Uh, when I have a problem with a server, I reboot it. Control, Alt, Delete. Start fresh, start over. Um, and maybe it's time for the Church of England, uh, yay, most of the Anglican communion, to have a reboot. What do you think? Well, Kevin, I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased to say that my bishops in the Church of, of the Christian Episcopal Church have given me permission to start a diocese in mm. this country, and so we're just forming it now. Um, there's there's about eight clergy who've come to me and saying we'd like to belong to a rebooted Anglicanism. I I, I have no ambitions to to launch an organisation. Goodness me, uh, institutional responsibility is not something that anyone who's in love with Jesus automatically embraces. But on the other hand. There has to be some kind of rebooting of Anglicanism. I've long thought we need an ACNA here. We have Andy Lyons and the Anglican Mission in England, uh, which is doing that in part at the at the Protestant end of the church. But yes, I, I, I very much hope that if uh, faithful priests and clergy in the Church of England can't find a way of rebooting the Church of England from within, well, maybe they'll associate themselves with Anglicans who are rebooting it from without. And we'll end with that. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashen, and you've been listening to episode 444 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>